the contested lands of the Darug people of Barramatta, where the naming of this place translates to the place of eels, embraced by the local NRL team. But the real history of this place is the lived experience and contested lands and the ultimate survival of a British colony. How the abundance of food and life in this place but still carry the legacy through the nearby suburbs of Westmead and Northmead, those being the western and northern meadows of the food source of an ill-fated colonial settlement in Sydney Cove. This mighty Parramatta River, it's eel and abundant country. I would like to acknowledge the ancient ones and our elders who have cared for country and for at a minimum tens of thousands of years. Country that goes beyond the land we enjoy today. It is the connectedness of country of people, of families, of language, of knowledges passed from one generation to another. I would like to acknowledge the knowledge and cultural exchange that we have afforded the opportunity to listen to today. Wisdom that is framed in our cultural heritage, accumulation of knowledge and decades of advocating for the presence of indigenous histories and knowledges into our Australian curriculum to fight for the rightful presentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices into our education systems. Some of this content presented today can be uncomfortable, but I know I'm personally grateful to be able to listen to these staunch women to learn from the transformation initiatives they've led and continue to lead to transform our education systems. Having this conversation, a truth-telling exercise is remarkable when we consider through the 1968 Boyer lectures, William Stanner famously described the great Australian silence, that Australia's sense of its past, its collective memory, have been built on a state of forgetting. Decades later, historian Henry Reynolds in his book, Why Weren't We Told, further elaborated that Indigenous histories and knowledges were excluded from our classroom texts and curriculum for over 70 years. Being here, engaging in this topic is a very important step to creating place-based research action that acknowledges country and place and the context where we live and work within. And as a proud, Wiradjuri woman, just really um, excited for what we're going to learn today. So next slide, Elise. Um, the Sydney Policy Lab at the University of Sydney and the Centre for People, Place and Planet at Edith Cowan University and the Centre of Just Places and Australia Together are jointly hosting this community of practice for place-based research action as we're equally committed to providing a space to gather for learning, reflection and collaboration with the objective to strengthen our practices to better support transformation and change. Hi everyone. I'm going to pass over to Kylie. Sorry, Kylie, you're on mute. How about now? Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name's Kylie. It's such a privilege to be here today to co-chair with Katie. Uh, in the sec second session of this community of practice, we're honoured to have Associate Professor Christine Evans and Aboriginal Education Consultative Group President Catherine, Tr uh, Catherine Trindle here to teach us about Indigenous research methodologies, country and place. So I'd like to acknowledge that I too live and am working on Darug land. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and recognise their continuing connection to and care for this land. So I'm a researcher at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use here at the University of Sydney, and I'm working on a trial of a program called Strong and Deadly Futures. So Strong and Deadly Futures is a co-created alcohol and drug prevention program for high school students that was developed through participatory research with Aboriginal and non-Indigenous students. So my work involves partnering with Aboriginal community controlled health organisations who show the program to Aboriginal adults and young people in their communities to get feedback and that feedback will result in a number of versions of the program. So we can provide it to schools in diverse communities across Australia. So I feel uh, really lucky, incredibly lucky to be able to be involved in this project and to work with different Aboriginal communities, the Community Controlled Health Organisation and AACG members too. So I've been working on this for nearly two years now and it's opened my eyes to how incredibly narrow my education has been. So as a researcher, the research method, methods that I learned at university and that I've seen prioritized and by extension valued have been Western methods. So it's part of the invisible exclusion of any other kind of knowledge or way of learning that our education system has been historically so good at. 
But thankfully that is changing now, thanks to the incredible work and commitment of people like Chris and Kathy. So we're really honored to have them here today to share parts of their stories. For me, what I'm really excited about is not just hearing about Indigenous methodologies and thinking about them as an alternative option available to me if I'm doing research in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. What I'm excited about is the way that it can inform all and improve all my research. So I want to read from a paper by Dr. Courtney Ryder, who's a Nunga woman and researcher, and there are several other authors on this paper too, Indigenous Research Methodology, Weaving a Research Interface. Um, and we'll put a link to that in the chat because it summarizes it really nicely. She describes the, con the combination of Western and Indigenous research methodologies as a weaving process, the weaving together of two different communities of knowledge. She says, research being conducted at the knowledge interface is an area where I must negotiate and prioritize the knowledge and values of two different worldviews. In the coming together and intertwining of these worldviews, there is an exciting op opportunity for innovation in research, which creates a new approach encompassing Aboriginal ways of knowing, being and doing, along with Western quantitative research approaches. Such an approach will enhance strength, self-determination and resilience to the research process ensuring that outcomes are transparent, specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So I really recommend reading the rest of that paper. And so this is, this is why I'm here today. This is where the magic is for me, learning about how to weave together different worldviews for the improvement of my research practice. So I recognize that as participants, you may be coming to this session for a range of reasons. Uh, for some people, Indigenous research methodologies may be a new concept. For others, you may be experienced practitioners. For others, you may have experienced research in your communities. So we're now going to be jumping into our first small groups and we'd love to for you to share. Um, I really hope you enjoyed your small groups with an opportunity to connect with someone new. I'm privileged now to introduce you to Associate Professor of Practice, Christine Evans, who's a practice-based academic in the School of Education and Social Work. Chris has driven change as a former secondary high school teacher through the New South Wales Education Standards Authority, NESA, as the Chief Education Officer of Aboriginal Education. She's a former academic appointment at UTS and the National Centre of Cultural Competency at the University of Sydney. She's a regional president of Met North Aboriginal Education Consultative Group on the board of the Museum of Contemporary Art, where she chairs the Indigenous Advisory Group, Somewhere in there, she finds time to supervise early career academics. And another fun fact is that Chris was a member of the first and only Indigenous crew to sail the Sydney to Hobart with Tribal Warrior in 2019. I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions for Chris. So please send them through on the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Welcome, Chris. Uh, Mandangu, thank you very much, Katie, for your beautiful kind words of introduction. Uh, it's lovely to see so many people, many I know, and uh, many I look forward to meeting uh, in time. So uh, thank, I, I would like to acknowledge the local families and custodians of the lands where I am located this afternoon, uh, who today call, um, who call this Garrigal land. Um, I acknowledge also the traditional custodians where each of you are situated. As a Wiradjuri woman with cultural and familial connection to the Mudgee region of New South Wales, I'm a guest on this country uh, and I'm living on the southern shore of Darabin, the Hawkesbury River, not far from the mouth of the river. Across the river on the north, um, on the shore to the north is Darkenjung land, to the east Gomegal, um, to the south the lands of the Darabaragal and to the west Darug country. Um, I pay my respects um, you know, to the families and custodians of these lands for their continued efforts to revitalise and maintain culture and connection. And I acknowledge Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander elders, aunties, uncles, brothers and sisters joining this event this afternoon and non-Indigenous colleagues and community members for the contributions you make to caring for country and caring about social justice. Uh, I also want to thank the supporters and conveners of this event series. It's a great honour to be part of this ongoing dialogue about place-based research and community agency. Uh, my contribution this afternoon will be in two parts. Firstly, I'll revisit some of the characteristics, histories and catalysts of Indigenous research methodologies, largely uh, through a selection of contributions by key exponents, 
And secondly, explore how those methodologies are able to bring attention to country place and to serve local communities. Uh, this presentation does not espouse that Indigenous research methodologies are the only methodologies to serve local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, nor that it is um, assumed that all Indigenous researchers use Indigenous research methodologies. We're very blessed to have Cathy Trindle, President, New South Wales AECG, join us today. Um, and Cathy will provide an overview of the Aboriginal organisation she represents, uh, the New South Wales AECG, Aboriginal Education Consultative Group, Inc., uh, and share about her own experiences of research on and or with Aboriginal people, including potentially on um, and with our young people. Uh, secondly, I will share some examples of where Indigenous research methodologies or associated research methods have contributed to meeting the goals or aspirations of Aboriginal communities. And then Cathy will share some community experiences of where Indigenous research methodologies have had a positive impact. We might go to the next slide, thanks. So today we're going to be speaking more about Indigenous research methodologies within higher education, um, but uh, it, it's remiss of me not to uh, remind us all and acknowledge um, that in fact, research has been undertaken by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities since creation. Um, and so this quote I feel, felt, um, you know, um, moves toward that sentiment. Um, this is by Morrison Rigney. <laughs> Adam and Diplock, for at least 65,000 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people successfully educated their youth through ancestrally perfected ways of learning in order to ensure that each generation was equipped with the knowledges, beliefs, and practices that enabled them to prevail across diverse and dynamic ecosystems. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this statement by Morrison, Rigney, Adam and Diplock in the context of culturally responsive pedagogies <coughs> excuse me, uh, refers to excellence and innovation in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledge management and knowledge production as it applies to country, place, kinship and culture. What are, it, it does beg the question, what are the fundamental knowledges of a collective that unbroken throughout centuries um, and, and, and how were they, they produced and tested in order to minimise harm, secure optimal futures and thereby contribute to cultural continuity and heritage protection. Thanks, Naomi. So what are some of those uh, concepts that are embedded um, within knowing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? <coughs> I'm going to look now at a few uh, of those concepts. Um, we talk a lot about culturally responsive pedagogies. Um, we talk about tag along learning, Readiness for knowledge is something that's really quite critical. And we hear in community those terms, when are people ready for more responsibilities? Here are terms such as yarning circles. We're very familiar with those terms um, in community. I know many people have seen a proliferation of <laughs> beautiful sandstone um, circular um, built environments in their schools and in environments. Uh, walking country, another very fundamental concept of being able to walk country, understand country, understand song lines, storying, cultural identity, fundamental to our existence as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Indigenous intellectual and cultural property, uh, some people may be familiar with, others may not. Um, it, it builds out of IP and in intellectual property, uh, but it's very nuanced. And it's also uh, in continual dialogue around how we as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, are able to um, protect our knowledges, manage our knowledges, uh, safeguard knowledges intergenerationally. And so people like Terry Janke have been, and uh, Robin Quiggan, people like that who we're very familiar with in terms of the advocacy that they've undertaken. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Seasonal calendar, something else that's fundamental to potentially dispelling some of the stereotypes that we've heard in past policies about nomads and people who meander aimlessly around, uh, around country. Uh, seasonal calendars are critical for knowing about management of, of country or place. Fire stick farming, another term that we've heard, sometimes we use cultural burn 
uh, cultural burn burns <coughs> and work being undertaken, obviously ongoing in that area and trend setting in so many ways. Another term that we're very familiar with is reciprocity. That notion that we, um, it's not about taking, it's about sharing and uh, that notion of, 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 not all, of being generous in terms of knowledge and experience and sharing. So I've, I've, I'm starting this presentation with where I will be ending the presentation, and that is around uh, curriculum. It is about some case studies toward the end of this presentation where the use and experiences from um, being familiar with uh, different methods and approaches in Indigenous research methodologies have been able to act as a catalyst for improvement and change in New South Wales uh, curriculum, in New South Wales syllabuses since 2017. Um, so moving on from here, these terms, interestingly, are now embedded and legitimised in New South Wales syllabuses. And you can see here some of the locations. These, these terms have been now validated through, dare I say, models that have drawn on learning from Indigenous research methodologies. Um, so <laughs> later in the presentation, toward the end, I'm going to share with you more examples. This is a, a, a vignette, if you like, of, of some of the, the uh, shifts that we've seen that have been valued so much by community uh, communities and in many cases have led to um, often localised cultural curriculum on country. So the ramifications are quite huge. It's also been a catalyst for greater engagement of uh, educators um, in, in terms of working with community. And so that's sometimes we have to say, be careful what we ask for. <laughs> and so in, in, in making these changes, so has uh, the demand increased for community as well. So we're not looking always, it's, there are going to be positives and negatives with change always. So thank you very much. We'll move on now, Naomi, to the next. Just a quick glance while we're talking about um, country and place. <clears throat> be aware that our beautiful young ones, our children, our nieces and nephews, grandchildren potentially uh, are, are already engaging through New South Wales education, through the curriculum about terms like country and place. So uh, here we have some excerpts from recently published New South Wales syllabuses, you know, that talk to the notion of what country might mean at that particular level for our young learners and what place might mean um, in this case. And you, there is a distinction here that's uh, evident in uh, New South Wales and Australian curriculum uh, between country and place. But please know that this is one um, interpretation and that place is used obviously differently uh, and has many, many meanings. So thank you, we'll move along. So what is country? Um, that's a really personal uh, interpretation that is probably outside of today's remit for me to share in terms of my full understand or my full um, interpretation of country. But I know that <clears throat> sometimes when I've spoken to um, various scientists uh, who are working or anthropologists uh, and archaeologists on country, on, on country that my family's connected with and they've spoken to me about the many, many thousands and thousands of years, um, the artefacts that, that they may collect or, or explore, you know, ha are, have originated from. It does help that to dig deep to really be reinforcing that connection with country um, and uh, it's about access uh, it's about storying it's about family stories of places uh, on country and having those connections and I know Kathy who's um, incredibly uh, you know um, proficient with language with Gomorrah language will share more there about how language is part of um, country, you know, that, that language uh, comes from country. But in this particular example, the image that you're seeing, um, this is a map of New South Wales Aboriginal languages or country, if you like. And, um, and it's often, it has been the case in history that our educations have been perhaps, you know, less than, less than optimal in terms of our learning of, of, of country and place. So I think people are only now just starting to understand that in fact, the extent, the extent of diversity of country for New South Wales. Here we have 
evidence of, you know, 35 Aboriginal languages and, you know, in excess of 100 dialects within New South Wales alone. Um, and in each of those cases, you know, there are 35 uh, economies, 35 um, law, systems of law, um, potentially, and arts practices and so on. So those people who are working, you know, uh, Indigenous researchers are very aware of the scope uh, and extent uh, of, of, of implications around resourcing, etc., cetera, uh, and complexity <clears throat> when working uh, in these contexts and same with non-Indigenous uh, researchers who work with community. Um, moving along, we also are looking here at what is place. And I've been quite specific likewise with the, the link to the Australian curriculum definitions. Uh, when I look at, when I share this um, graphic of the Torres Strait Islands. Um, so place in the Australian curriculum uh, refers, uh, and this is this was informed by Torres Strait Islander educators on the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Advisory Committee for ACARA <coughs> um, when the Australian curriculum was being developed. So just a little reminder that for some people, the word place may be very specific to Torres Strait Island, to the Torres Strait Islander communities. Thank you. We'll move on to the next slide. And for those who may be just moving toward, um, you know, increasing their knowledge of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures, um, you can access the map of Aboriginal Australia produced by IATSIS. And I believe someone will probably pop that in the chat as, as well, but I won't look at that just today. I think most people are familiar. So we'll quickly, I thought we might start by looking at some of the characteristics of Indigenous research methodologies. And as I said, this is in higher education. Um, so initiative, first of all, uh, Indigenous research methodologies are conducted <coughs> by Indigenous researchers and informed by community knowledges, experiences and priorities. They expand, they add to existing higher education research methodologies. And we're going to look at, um, you know, some, some particular representations by uh, key exponents in the next part of this session. And, <clears throat> and we'll be able to see there that the, the desire, the desperation at times, the frustration of not having that easy access to um, or place to rest, particularly also for HDR students, Aboriginal students who are you know, working between two worlds, you know, and I experienced it myself. And I give the example of <clears throat> when I was completing my um, PhD, I had uh, an outstanding non-Indigenous science education uh, professor who was my supervisor, but I had a, a, an equally um, high in esteem uh, cultural educator, Uncle Tex Guthorpe, a Noongaburra man, who was um, my cultural mentor through the process. And just a little share for you was occasions where I felt as though I was in completely in two different worlds where uh, I would say to my, my university supervisor, Peter, how long do you think I'll need for, a, for my interview or for my uh, focus group? And Peter would say, oh, you know, 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes. And then I'd say, Uncle Tex, how, many, how long do you think I need? Um, with these questions with community. And he would say, mm, two or three days. <laughs> so, um, you know, very interesting that the work that is being done still to be done in terms of establishing what some cultural norms might be. Uh, they can coexist with other methodologies. And I think for some people who are here today, you know, there's probably some curiosity about how that might operate and how that might work. But certainly in my own experience, I've combined um, Indigenous research methodologies with action research. Um, it's available in, in terms of mixed methodologies, but, um, or mixed methods, um, but some uh, Indigenous researchers might also see a, a logic in some level of separation. And sometimes that goes to the fact that um, some quantitative, you know, qualitative uh, research methodologies uh, are still governed, you know, that there's still parameters where Indigenous knowledge is not as legitimised and not as holistic. So that data may well be um, still um, subject to, you know, not including um, notions of, of um, storying, the legitimation of storying, yarning, spirituality and other cultural factors. 
Um, so, but it is, uh, it, is, it, it is often the case that um, participatory action research and Indigenous research methodologies can work. I also used arts-based uh, research in my own doctoral work and other projects. Um, they do use culturally responsive, and I've indicated culturally responsible research methods. And we'll look a little later at um, some of those examples. Um, certainly um, in the case of some of the work that I've completed at Nessa, we had um, very much um, you know, a, a, a focus on creating culturally safe environments with which to um, allow Aboriginal participants, community um, members, stakeholders to speak very freely without feeling um, as though they were diminished in number and not confident to speak. So um, moving along through the others quickly, I'm sorry I'm running out of time. Um, they do accord with Indigenous cultural protocols. They prioritise justice and improvement for communities. There is inevitably a privileging of Indigenous voice. And we see that through the work of, uh, in, you know, Lester Rigney with his Indigenous research methodology. We see that with Martin Nakata. We see this with a number of other um, proponents of this. Uh, they often emerge or evolve with this comfort and opportunity People will use an opportunity, and we see in the next shortly in the next slide some of the ways we've appropriated, in a sense, or utilised existing methodologies um, for our own purposes. Um, there's definitely an engagement. Oops, in critical reading of Indigenous settler relationship histories. In fact, that's often at the core of the motivation and the catalyst for this work. And of course, land country place, sovereignty, cultural identity and self-determination are very much set at the centre and core of this work. And interestingly, we have often been represented in past tense or in fact not at all. And I think certainly the work of so many Indigenous research researchers using Indigenous methodologies um, are very focused on the here and now, you know, that, for example, the standpoint theory of, of Martin Nakata's work and, um, you know, this notion of the, of, the, of the here and now, the issues currently affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but still ensuring that there's an alignment with customary ways of knowing, doing and being. Thank you. I, mean, I just quickly want to show this image of, uh, by Margaret Kovac. She, her argument is that Indigenous methodologies can't possibly reside exclusively within qualitative methodologies because Indigenous knowledges can't be owned and possessed and managed by, um, you know, in higher ed by, by non-Indigenous um, um, academics and by the academy, okay? And that's part of that ICIP um, issue we talked about before in the continuity of cultural knowledge. Thank you. We'll look to the next. This is a particular um, model that's been, um, it gained a lot of um, popularity uh, in the US, two-eyed seeing. And again, as I referred to, it was participatory action research with Indigenous research methodologies. So it's a beautiful weaving of um, action research as we typically know it, but utilizing um, a number of other um, uh, priorities of, and, and you know, around self-determination, community engagement, notions of storytelling. And then the last one was uh, another slide by a non-Indigenous um, scholar from Western Australia, who I, I share this because I felt it was uh, really brave uh, and significant that a non-Indigenous um, academic or researcher um, was trying to map how to navigate as an ally um, the multiple um, theories that are, exist um, in, this, in this space. So we'll move on again. What I'd like to do, uh, oh, sorry, so this is just a very quick glance at, uh, you know, of, of um, Indigenous research methodology theories and, and, and uh, in terms of historical viewpoint. And I, I just wanted to touch base and look at how over time, you know, first of all, acknowledge the recency of these methodologies and understand that as, as we know, Aboriginal people have not always, we've not always had a place at the table in higher ed as students, as scholars, as researchers, and we can see that there is a lot of growth recently. There's still also that question, where will we be in five years, in 10 years? So if we look at this um, particular 
configuration of dates and um, methodologies and theories. It's just interesting to see evolutions and ecologies of thought. So we've moved from here that we've got back in history in 37, critical theory. We see then a movement toward critical race theory. And more recently, um, we see through Brayboy's work, you know, tribal critical race theory. So this continual appropriation and use of opportunity uh, and, and uh, lobbying, if you like, and, and repossessing and reinterpreting um, different methodologies that currently exist. Similarly, uh, I, we know that um, Lester Rigney uh, and others have, you know, and indeed Martin Nakata have acknowledged their reliance on the work of feminist theorists as well. Um, so thank you. Sorry, I know I'm running out of time. <laughs> so what we're going to do here is just really quickly move through a number of quotes. And I've highlighted certain terms. I talked about the catalysts. What is it that drives us? What is it that has driven our those who've gone before us in terms of developing these Indigenous research methodologies? And I acknowledge Wendy Brady, who, as I was a you know PhD student myself, I was uh, held her work in you know high esteem in terms of how radical it was at the university, and yet we are still you know in this time advocating for for change and improvement. Here we have self determination measured uh, mentioned. Uh, we're just going to flick through these. Uh, we won't be able to read them all. Um, with Rigney, we see resistance as the emancipatory imperative, political integrity, Aboriginal people controlling research, driving research, leading research. Uh, the privilege, privileging of Indigenous voices, it seems so um, straightforward, and yet the, it, it, the, the challenges sometimes are so insurmountable and so continual. Uh, and this is 1997. Moving along to the next piece, Brayboy, right, talks about how the motivation for um, this, you know, creating this theoretical framework of tribal critical race theory talks about how it allows me to address the complicated relationship between American Indians and the United States federal government. So we see we see this continual thread of, of this, this trying to resolve uh, issues of complexity, you know, you know, cont contested scenarios but the politics of who can be represented, who's going to be, uh, who will have a voice and how we are continually often quite exhausted by this process of decolonizing um, research, decolonizing processes and gaining access to, um, you know, it, it's still within the university in so many spheres for research and also teaching. Moving on to the next ones here. Um, Martin's, Martin Nakata's uh, work here talks about you know, people's lived experience at the cultural interface. Again, it's the tension, the intersections, trying to resolve, trying to solve, trying to advance community interests in, in, a, in a state of, you know, complexity. Uh, and also how that is the point of entry. It's not that we are becoming subjects in that again, as we have in years past. Moving along, I see this as a lovely celebration of those who've gone before. I hope you can join me in this. Um, he, he also talks about Martin, this theory that has as its first principle, um, you know, to generate accounts of communities of Indigenous people in contested knowledge spaces. Agency, affording agency to people, this emancipatory process, change, the desire for improvement in all these conditions. The same, you know, same issues being raised throughout all of these quotes. Um, acknowledges the everyday tensions, complexities. No, but thank you. We'll move on. Thank you. And I, I love this statement by uh, Margaret Kovac about we are now at a point where it is not only Indigenous knowledges themselves that require attention, but the process by which Indigenous knowledges themselves are generated. And again, we, we know ourselves. We get very anxious when we are represented or our communities are represented in ways that are not culturally safe and not necessarily uh, culturally, uh, you know, where it's not responsible. And so I thought this, this, this work she's doing around tribal research methodologies is, is really helpful or has been helpful. I know this is an older um, publication. Moving on. And here we talk. So what I found interesting was the trend towards more broad Indigenous research methodologies that are perhaps more politically motivated uh, broadly political, to then the, this, the trend towards bringing this, the, the, the Indigenous research methodology to the local community level to clan, as clan-based or, or try, in this case, tribal, tribally-based. 
And here we see how she was motivated. The catalyst for her was to uh, bridge Plains Cree knowledges and their methods in a manner translatable to Western research. And the ne in the next slides, I think you'll see also the here we have Jonathan Jones in his doctoral work, um, you know, talking about the Indiamara, okay, which is we have a quote at the bottom, we have a definition at the bottom, but you, you're seeing language use as well, language from country, okay, and that notion of Indigenous research methodology um, applying to clan or uh, philosophies of, of particular groups. And so, um, it, you know, and then there are questions, is that applicable? Can that be used, you know, in, for different countries across different clans and so on? But this is part of the conversations that continue on. Here, historically, these shields have been given little Yindyamara, little respect. And he talks there about how that was an opportunity lost, that people had given up on these shields and left them hidden, gathering dust or stored away for no one to see. But he had opened those up and shown them respect to, to in an attempt to start to relocate them through cultural knowledge as opposed to um, theoretical knowledge. So, 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 that, so the, the, the uh, positive outcomes that can be made by showing respect in research. Moving along, we'll look at the next one uh, here. Again, coming back to the purpose of this place-based research concept we're working on, you know, here we talk about how Indigenous research methodologies emerge from Indigenous epistemologies or knowledge frameworks. So they are always people and place specific, okay, and need to be tailored and match community needs. In my doctorate, I talk about cultural QA, cultural quality assurance. I heard the, the, the word from um, Judy Ketchell on Thursday Island and uh, was aware of the language and culture group on Thursday Island. Anything to do with Torres Strait on the knowledge goes through through that committee, that group of community members, and it's just so reassuring and beautiful that they engage in the way they do in that work, important work. Um, next, we only have one or two left. Similarly here, um, Linda Smith talks about in decolonizing methodologies, and this is the 2021 uh, edition in all community approaches process that is methodology and method is highly important and we come back again to to be respectful to enable people to heal and to educate and again we see this notion of towards self-determination and that ongoing tension you know we it, it as I've read as I've been collecting these I, I think to myself what must it be like to have a blue skies clean clean slate, if you like, to be doing the work we want, we would like to do unencumbered, you know, what would be optimal conditions for us around research. So thank you. We'll move along to the last slide, I think. Okay. And of course, yeah, Eileen uh, Morton Robinson uh, has such a profound contrib has been such a uh, remarkable leader in this space. And we just love, some, I love some of these statements, you know, uh, that we, you know, have been, Indigenous scholars have demonstrated Indigenous nations continue to exercise our sovereignties in our political struggles um, and how we have gone to war, we have refused, and, and we have used political and legal mechanisms to challenge the legitimacy of Canada, Australia, the United States, New Zealand, Hawaii states, and their sovereign claims to exclusive possession of their lands. But talking again about catalysts and motivations in the last sentence, as resilient existence, our sovereignties continue ontologically and materially. As humans, we are the embodiment of our lands. Thank you. I'll pick this up a little bit later with some case studies. Thank you so much, Chris. There were some beautiful quotes there. So it's um, everyone can rest assured that they will get the slides later um, and be able to go back over them. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the president of the New South Wales Aboriginal Education Consultative Group, Catherine Trindle. Catherine is a Gomeroy woman with more than 30 years of experience working in Aboriginal education in New South Wales. She's been awarded the highest level of recognition by the New South Wales ACG when she was formally inducted as a New South Wales ACG life member in 2018. She began her work in education in 1985 as the first Aboriginal teaching assistant in Tamworth before becoming a primary trained teacher. Catherine's taught extensively in the city, rural and remote areas of New South Wales, where she's held many roles and positions across the Department of Education. Catherine's the current deputy chair and ministerial appointee to the New South Wales Aboriginal Languages Trust Board 
And more recently, she's under, undertaken a considerable body of work in leading and coordinating New South Wales TAFE's work around the teaching and learning of Aboriginal languages. In March this year, she was formally elected to the position of New South Wales Aboriginal Education Consultative Group Inc. President. So once again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll pass it over to Catherine now. Okay, thank you. Um, wow, what an honour. Um, and apologies for being late. Um, as it would be, I was actually on another live Zoom, <laughs> which lasted for about an hour and a half. So, um, but I, I, I've made it here in time. So if you'd like to, um, and I'm just going to take you through initially uh, around the uh, what the New South Wales C2 is, and we'll have a bit of a yarn as, as we go along. So if you'd like to kindly move across to the very first slide, um, and I will just like to acknowledge country. So I'll say to you, Yamagaba Yarada, Nay Yid, Catherine Trindle, Gomoroi Madiena, Wallabiega Nyugampa, Blue Dan Gunyo, Nadakuraidi, Naringlana, Walailana, Tamathga, Gabaninda Madden, Gabaninda Nindai, Naya, Walailana, Iroraga, Gabaninda. Um, hi everyone, my name is Catherine Trindle. Um, I am the new president of the um, newly elected president of the New South Wales ACG. I've been here for seven months and before I go further, um, I really wish to pay my deepest respects and condolences to um, our community and to the wider community, to each and every one of you who may have met our, our former president, Cindy Berwick, and acknowledging her passing and acknowledging the legacy that she will leave with us to remind us that we need to continue to fight for justice, equality, and to ensuring that our students and our communities receive access to and be afforded access to the education that they thoroughly deserve at their choices. So um, it's been a very big learning journey. It's been full of lots of humps and bumps along the way, but I would never change what I, where, I, where I am today. So I also wish to acknowledge my parents, my mother and father, for their drive, their tenacity, their, their love of educating. And I would not be here in this position where I am today. So, um, yes. And I'd also take this opportunity to acknowledge another significant life member who was one of our finding, foundation members, Adi Delma. Aunty Delma has just recently passed. So the New South Wales ACG has had a significant loss with three of our members um, of another local ACG member recently passing as well. So it's been a been a been a loss. But what I take away from that is what they've left behind. And what they've left behind for us is their knowledge, their strength, their passion, their tenacity, and, and their hindsight. And so um, big shoes to fill, but we will do it collectively. And it's never one person that drives the AECG. The strength lies within the local and regional AECG. So if we go to the, the next slide, um, it's the New South Wales AECG was founded in 1977. And it came around for a number of reasons. The, the, once again, there was a, an upswell of um, our community members and their inability to be able to get equity for their students, they were, their, their children. They weren't able to get them the appropriate um, education that they deserved. They were being excluded. And there's been so many policies that have been um, disempowering to our people that our local community members decided that they needed to have that fight to be able to lead it. We would not be here today as a community controlled organisation if they didn't continue that fight. The uniqueness around New South Wales AECG and one other state, which is Victoria and Bay Eye, we're the only two standing community controlled Aboriginal organisations that their peak advocacy is around education and training. 
the rest of them were disbanded and that they were placed um, under government control as opposed to community control and they were ministerial appointments. But for us, New South Wales, through the fight, said, no, it's not going to happen on our watch. We need to maintain our integrity and our commitment to the uniqueness that we have here within New South Wales. And through solidarity, they petitioned and they fought, and they fought really hard. And today, 44 years later, we are still a community-controlled and independent organisation that advocates on all things education for our community. Um, if you go on to the next slide, you'll see that our primary role um, is to promote participation on all levels in all decision matters. And it's just around um, the importance of being the conduit, being the voices when our voices have often been silenced, having the courage and the conviction to go in and say, it's not acceptable to be happening on my watch. But if we work together in partnership, life will be a lot easier, a lot, lot easier if we're able to do it together. So we are renowned not only across all levels of New South Wales, from government to non to, to, to government to um, non-government organisation, all levels of state, um, localised state, right through up to the Commonwealth as the number one peak organisation. And it's important that that is acknowledged because if you pull up any documentation that sits in the space of education, the New South Wales ACG, particularly around curriculum, are the ones that are ensuring that there's clarity, that there's truth, and that it is embedded and it is not added on into what needs to be taught. But we're also able to do the support that sits around that by ensuring that we give support to our um, partners along the way. Um, how big are we? Well, this is how big we are. We have 157 local AECGs, which is then broken into 20 regional AECGs that sit right across every single length and breadth and tiny little crevice of, of New South Wales as we know it. We are unique because we are driven from our local voices who are sustaining us to where we are. The way it works is that the locals have a regional, have a local president, a vice president, a secretary, a treasurer, and a committee members, and then committee members. You can go to them, you can discuss things with them, you can talk about research with them. Um, you can talk about curriculum, you can talk about relationships, you can talk about engagement, you can talk about anything and they will support you. Otherwise, they will be the conduit between you, the community and whoever you need to receive that information from. If you are seeking endorsement, you come back from um, that local organisation, um, you take it up to your local, to your regional and then the regional will bring it up to the state where we have a state committee and those representatives, there are seven of them that come from across the state of New South Wales, where they are elected to. Um, we have the president, which is myself, our vice president, Mr. Lee Ridgeway from the Hunter Coat, from, the, from Newcastle. Um, and then we have a secretary, a treasurer, and then five other members. So that makes up our management committee. And then within here at Stanmore, we have a secretariat, and that secretariat looks at a curriculum officer, it looks at policy officers. We run so many different programs, which I'll talk to you later on. And of course, we are affiliated with the, um, you know, the Aboriginal Studies Association. If we flick across to the, the next one, you can see that it's you know, New South Wales um, Education Act in 1990. It's provision of an education for Aboriginal children that has regard to their special needs development of an understanding of Australian history and culture by all children. But it goes further than all children. All representatives, regardless of position, regardless of title, everyone needs to ensure that they know the true history of this country and that through embedded, the embeddingment of localised, contextualised um, stories 
um, and histories, it is embedded across curriculum where it needs to be. It's important that that is acknowledged because it's around the fact that we are not all the same people. We are different people, whether they're from the coast or whether or not we're inland. It is, it, it is important that it comes from a localised and contextualised space. So the framework around curriculum enables educators on all levels, whether you work within the department or the universities or wherever you may be sitting in the early years, um, outside of the training areas, that the, the, there is, it's been able to be scaffolded for you to be able to then engage through the process of local and regional ACGs um, to be able to be a part of that story journey so that it is truth telling and that therefore it is no longer being isolated or uh, in terms of where it is. One of the things that we do extremely well, and I must say that we do a lot of really good things, and if we flip to the next slide across to the next slide, it's around connecting to country. There's a lot of words there, and I'm not going to read them for you. But connecting to country means so many things to so many people and has so many different layers. It's not a, um, a one-stop shop approach. Connecting to country for me means that when I'm driving home and I'll get to a certain point and I look across the plains as I'm coming up to and then coming up to the hill, I know that I'm back onto country. It means knowing country. It means that country knows me. It's around knowing place of country, the special places, the places you can go to that gives you knowledge, that gives you strength, that gives you medicine, that gives you sustainability. The ones that gives you and anchors you to place and your places of belonging. Nayagid, Gomoroi Mariina, Wallaby Yagu Nara Pride. I'm at Gomoroi Mariina. My place of belonging is the Gomoroi Nation, my traditional homelands of Narabra. I know stories. I know connections. Has it always been connected? For my family, it has. But for others, there's been a disconnection. So it's around place and the place of where that is. And it's about learning to know how to engage, to share our experiences, to be partners in the journey of education. While our focus is education, it is not a Western construct. No way. It is around educating us through connecting to country, which isn't linear, it's holistic. We need to take components of everything to make that one big, beautiful place that we live in. That is what connecting the country is. And that's what education is. It's being literate of country. It's being numerate of country. Country knowing you and you knowing country. I encourage each and every one of you, the New South Wales ACG delivers a course over three days. It's not just for teachers. It's for anyone that wants to go through on a, on a discovery tour. And I say that with all due respect. It's, not, it, it's around engaging with people and place that you may not have had the opportunity of doing so. It's around looking through our eyes, connecting, being able to disconnect, to reconnect in a new way of thinking, a new way through a different lens, through our lenses. For over three days, we'll share stories. We will give life experiences. We will share the good times and we'll share things that make us who we are and who we and why we are like we are it's in, it's so important that we can do this if we go to the next slide you can see that this program is just it's one of those programs which is life-changing for a lot of people it's a different way of doing business, 
not for us because we've been doing it since time immemorial. We've been doing it and coming from a space of yarning and listening, engaging experiences, not just listening with your vinans, vinangala vinans. Don't listen just with them. You have to also listen with your eyes and your heart and you have to be open to everything that's around you so that you can actually do it. If, if, the, if we are to change the way we do things, it's around finding the time and the place and the space to listen. Now, this is going to sound strange, but some of the best listening is silence. Because once you're in that space, you will begin to know, you'll begin to understand, and you'll be able to connect with what the Connecting to Program is around. Understanding the disconnection from the forced removal from Aboriginal lands, the forced removal of all the policies which have been indoctrinated and lived and live under and still live under. And all that research that you do and will continue to do in the future will make more meaning to it. At the bottom of the screen, if you want more information, there's a phone number there for you or email us and we will make sure that you are connected with your local AECG. And your local AECG will be able to run one of those workshops for three days when you're able to come out and be on country and get to know them and get to know and re-get to know our, our community members. Um, one of the other things that we do, and if we have a look at the next slide, we do a, uh, a no, it's called Pemaway. I'm sure we all know who Pemaway is. It's written there for you. What a remarkable man. I also understand through a bit of my research too that the Australian Army may have or may not have based some of their um, armed forces and their strategies around the strategies that Pemaway and Tedbury, his son, actually used in guerrilla warfare. Um, and I just think that's remarkable that they were able to use that um, to be able to do it. And, to, and we are still, to this day, very much resistance fighters. But that newsletter shares all of those wonderful things that are happening out on country, all the wonderful news that, that's happening, whether it's around people receiving awards, uh, we will do an acknowledgement to, to Cindy in there um, and we'll do one for Arnie Dell that was in there. So it, it's a way of just trying to get a little glimpse into what's happening across the New South Wales landscape in relation to the New South Wales AUCG. You'll get to see some of the wonderful programs, whether or not it's our Aboriginal Languages and Culture Camps or our STEM camps. STEM camps are incredible. Um, because it's not just around science and maths and engineering. It's around looking at from our perspective on what STEM means. When our kids can go walking country and they know country, they know where to get the water, they know the, the, the time that they need to go, they know all around the, um, the dinner one and they're going to go like, in the sky. They know when to get the eggs and when not get to eat, get the eggs. They know, you know when it's safe to go out bush and when it's not safe to go out bush. Um, to me, that is STEM because it's around um, looking at the sciences, looking at um, numerically the calendar dates. It's around knowing spatial distance. It's around problem solving, solving in how, will, how are we going to get there from where we need to be. All of that is embedded into curriculum. It, it's all embedded into our ways of life. So if you get an opportunity, you jump onto our website, which is down the bottom, you'll see the newsletter. Take a, take a little glance through there and just see some of the wonderful things that is going to happen. We are hoping to have a new one at the end of the year that uh, coming up very shortly. Um, I have to admit that there's not a really 
that we haven't done one for the last few months, and that's only be just due to, to COVID and so forth. But it, it is definitely going to be coming ahead. The next slide is around CAPO. I'm not sure whether or not you've heard of CAPO, but it's pretty important. All of us community controlled organisations have a coalition and they're called the New South Wales Coalition of Aboriginal Peaks. We are all unique because we are community controlled organisations. We advise government. I'm sure each and every one of you would have under or, or be uh, privileged to the Premier's priorities um, or the former Premier's prior, former Premier and her priorities. Very first time in Australian history and New South Wales history that Aboriginal people were given to be a priority. Why would that be? We know historically why. We know that the systems are failing us. We're not failing the system. The system is failing us to get us educated to where we need to be. So therefore, the Premier, in hindsight, along with CAPO, have said, this is what we want, and this is how we're going to negotiate with you to be able to do it. As you can see, those organisations cover a very diverse range of people, from our disabilities uh, to our, um, you know, the, to the link up to our stolen generations, right across, right across. And then if you flick across to the, the next slide, you'll see that what do we do? We actually provide that strong, independent, coordinated voice to address issues affecting us mob today. Why? So that we can actually then start to self-determine what that looks like for us as not only people, but as a collective and across community. But I must say that we do not speak on behalf of everyone. We are just one avenue. We are collective, we are one voice that gives a voice, a coordinated voice, to listen to concerns and to acknowledge the achievements that we do. And with the next one, you will see that who we are, who makes up that coalition under the Closing the Gap and the National Partnership Agreement. And we work in partnership with other organisations and, organ and uh, with other organisations and agencies on closing the gap across the state. We have a long way to go, but we have to start somewhere. And with the former Premier making that decision and enabling us to be able to work together as a collective, we'll be able to make a lot more inroads into a number of the concerns around whether it's um, inappropriate housing, whether it's uh, even, even the area of research. So in the, uh, you've got to look at the cultural protocols, you've got to look at cultural governance, you've got to understand the uniqueness of our SMOB and what that means to be constantly researched. I think at this point, um, and I'll take lead from um, Chris or, or Kerry at this stage. I think we're going into small breakout groups to give yeah, you an opportunity thanks to reflect. Thanks so much, Kathy. That was brilliant. Um, I think really, obviously, on the back of, you know, so much of blood, sweat and tears about trying to create change, but really just understanding um, that authenticity of what it means to work with community um, and just you know, the community keeps coming to the table and wanting to have a voice. And I think that's that's just mind blowing as well. So I just really want to thank you for your time and just giving all that insight. So yes, we are gonna jump into a breakout. We're gonna have um, eight minutes in our, in our group. So we'd really love you to um, click into those spaces and there is um, the slides to write some notes if you wanted to do that. But yeah, just eight minutes on what you've, um, reflect on what you've heard, how it, how it intersects with the work you're doing and potentially um, new ways of working on current and future projects, whether that's research or engagement. Um, and we'll um, hopefully get to some questions um, later, um, but this you know, content is so valuable for us all. So um, great to, we'll see you soon. Um, Thank you. Um, thanks so much. Um, and for the rest of this section, I will, I'll try and abbreviate it as much as I can. I'm going to close by looking at some of the what I think is, um, you know, very exciting um, new content that's come about from, as, as 
um, Kathy was saying, listening to community, hearing what's been asked for, and trying very hard to use, you know, Indigenous research methodologies and methods to acquire or to, to uh, deliver and serve communities in that way. Uh, so thanks, we'll start those slides and we'll move fairly quickly. Um, it is a bit of a story for me this afternoon in terms of getting to that last slide of, and look all those last slides looking at the content. Um, so if we might just advance to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to just share the, the I suppose, the journey for me um, prior to coming, doing the work that I was doing in New South Wales curriculum. I started, um, you know, I obviously completed a, a PhD D, an EDD rather at UTS and it was um, called Designing Higher Education Curriculum in Partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Stakeholders. My background's in visual arts education. Uh, I'd been a secondary teacher for 12 years or so before I moved into higher education and I suppose I came with that sort of passion and love for the arts um, and in doing that too, you know, culturally the connection with the arts is really significant and I guess visual communication. So I carried that into the work and, and what was quite fascinating was uh, what I would like to share with you is just that notion of using uh, a, you know, a different way of communicating in, during research and some of the impacts that that had for community members uh, and their experience of research. So in this case, um, I would share with community members in this particular project, which was based um, around the, the campus where I was working uh, and it engaged with the Aboriginal community and some non and some Torres Strait Islander uh, representatives um, or stakeholders uh, about how curriculum could be improved at that particular you know, higher ed site. Um, and so um, it, it was almost exclusively um, an Indigenous uh, participatory, uh, participant um, uh, group, uh, apart from the one thing, of course, when the, when a mother of one of the Aboriginal uh, participants decided to come along, and then, it, of course, that shattered my whole notion of it being a solely Indigenous <laughs> set of respondents, and, of course, that made complete another sense, and and uh, and we expanded to incorporate those her views. But this image shares the story of how, at the top left, I travelled from a university setting, the square meaning, you know, a, it's a very conventional Western um, um, icon or image or graphic for, you know, um, uh, that we often have used. And I think it's an Egyptian origin um, of the square and used through religious architecture and other forms throughout history. I used that to represent the university where I was, you know, leave, you know, you basing my research on traveled out. The arrows show that I went out and conducted you know, some um, yarning circles, focus groups and, and individual interviews with um, community members and stakeholders. I brought that data, that information back in terms of an action research cycle, if you like, to reflect on it back at the university and, um, and then come out again with, you know, another set of interventions again. <laughs> completing another set of yarning circles um, and interviews. So what was interesting was community read that image almost immediately. I mean, I shared some words, but it was, it was for them somehow, for some, not all, but for some, it was quite refreshing to not have an abundance of text to consume and uh, to validate uh, visual communication form in the res within the research. Uh, it was, I, I, I used an Indigenous research methodology combined with action research and arts and arts-based pro uh, process as well. Uncle Tex Guthorpe was very generous and gave me permission to um, use a collective art making process to generate data. And what was interesting was we could, we can perhaps all sort of simplify or uh, react or respond to the notion of art making in various ways. But in fact, it was the yarning over the art making that was incredibly important in terms of generating uh, conversation, ideas and testing views. So I understood more about where Uncle Tex had taken that in terms of community um, development pre prior to that. Sorry, moving along, I know I don't have a lot of time. This was my speak back about action research cycles. I sort of had young children at the time and I must admit it's interesting how resourceful we can be when they were on the foreshores of Derebin here, the beautiful Hawkesbury River at the little swimming hole down there. The, the sand was probably the, the best graphic option I had many times. So I often drew my ideas in the sand and photographed them. And that became part of the process, I suppose, along the way. But the point here was in, in my thesis or my doctoral work that Aboriginal communities have been undertaking research, you know, 
generation for generations and so this was just an assertion if you like of of that within the within the research moving along to we come to so here as an indigenous researcher i wanted to know the diversity and recognize the diversity in the research just these are just quick little vignettes if you like to show what an indigenous researcher might um, bring to the table and in the previous you know slide it was looking at the Aboriginal cultural affiliation of, of the um, um, members. So, you know, we had Waka Waka, Respondent, Yagel, Gomoroi, Wiradjuri, Palawa, Yagara, you know, so if this was to sort of not, not everyone would look at their, um, their uh, participants, I suppose, with that level of um, interest in terms of, of um, moving across those different language groups. Sorry, moving along, thank you. <laughs> Here was here was some of the findings from the arts based component respondents in that in that particular study uh, were very interested in future visual arts teachers engaging at the local level critical. This was the message, a resounding message with local elders with local Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community and local country or place. Knowing whether you're on saltwater country or freshwater country, being able to understand those those concepts and what that means in terms of, as Kathy was saying, that notion of connection and knowing place and country, expanded engagements. They they really wanted people to know um, more than one Aboriginal person in that process. You know, more than one Aboriginal organisation. Be be able to introduce yourself. You know, for this is for visual arts teachers get to know more people, get to know the, the community in a more fulsome way. And don't feel that, that you need to rely on just one voice because we, as, as Cathy said too, the ACG, it's about the collective. You know, it's about a cultural quality assurance by the collective, not individuals. Um, commitment to long-term professional development, knowledge of cultural protocols that came through as a theme in the research around appropriation of, of visual arts imagery um, and cultural knowledge. So, and interestingly, um, in terms of knowledge of subject matter, it was not just um, teachers' uh, deep knowledge of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander visual arts. They also, the community expected um, teachers to have uh, skills around literacy and numeracy. And that is because, as Cathy had said, you know, education has not been optimal for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in this state, uh, across this country. And this is still a priority, even though the con this research was about visual arts teachers. Um, also, the skills to respectfully acknowledge and situate spirituality within teaching and learning. That was a, a point of contention along the way, as though it was often left out or um, diminished or, um, you know, somehow it wasn't, you know, official knowledge or acceptable knowledge. Uh, and then this notion of reciprocity, not forever asking of community uh, with, you know, without that sense of respect of seeing an outcome. Kerry Sheehan and I were just talking about it in the in the Zoom and with our colleagues, and and it was that notion of seeing action. I think his words were seeing something that demonstrates someone has been listening, and is prepared even incrementally to to, to shift uh, the, a process along in a positive way for community. Thank you. I'll move to the next slide. Moving on to another project that was operating concurrently, we had uh, some Australian government um, quality teaching Indigenous project funding that supported this particular study while I was at uh, UTS and I was a, an academic there for 15 years or so. Um, and again, um, at a conference, I decided for a change that I would present some of the findings in graphics, in visual communication, because I felt that sometimes uh, for this, the audience comprised educators, department executive, as well as Aboriginal community members who were part of the research. And um, when the evaluations came back, the organisers of the conference were really confused because the community members responded really favourably to these graphics because I was able to explain the story, you, you know, and, and it was using a, a, a different, using country, using graphics, using, you know, a very validated way of communicating. So in this case, um, this was, I was explaining this as meaning that every school, every education provider is on Aboriginal country. And this dealt with the constituency of, of, uh, of the community, elders, com teachers approaching elders first, knowing who those elders are, knowing who the knowledge holders, keepers um, uh, are, and then understanding who may be just visiting to, to, to that site or who's, who might be um, there for work rather than residing in the longstanding families. So it's really helping um, new teachers to navigate um, the community, uh, their connections within community. 
the next slide I think is moving on again. This was an image I created on my reflection around one of the themes and that is the circle of course is community. The square inside was one of the school sites and the, 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 um, the, the uh, cycles that are going through it in, tell a story about how with this particular Q-tip project and the action re uh, research that was occurring, it was the first time in the whole of school planning that Aboriginal staff were involved, strangely as that might seem. And this was obviously in 2009. But what it was saying was that, that all staff agreed that that had led to far more sophisticated solutions and higher quality uh, you know, future directions for the school by having that. And then that also developed further trust with the community. The next slide, I think, is looking also at the vital role of AEOs. And that was one of the themes that came through the research and that critical place that they hold between community and, and schools. And also to the, sometimes the pressure that that puts on an AEO or in that at that time called an Aboriginal Education Assistant. Um, so this image uh, resonated with the audience who I was presenting to, the Aboriginal community members who, who absolutely knew of, the, of that vital role of someone who, was, who, who goes between, excuse me, the school and community, but also the need to, to keep those, those representatives safe. Um, in terms of the, the that cultural load, I think that we talk about the work of the school and the you know and the work associated with the community and living in that in that space. So again, another vital theme that came through, but shared through through image. Sorry, yeah, we're good. We'll look on look on next to the. As I finally in closing, I've just got a few slides to share with you. Um, I started at the beginning of this of the session today, sharing with you some concepts. Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander concepts and, and uh, sharing with you where they have been now located and legitimised in locations in curriculum where they are likely to be assessed. What's critically different about um, this use of, I guess, uh, the Indigenous research methodologies that I had used in these former projects and led into my work at NESA as um, Chief Education Officer, Aboriginal Education, was that um, two things were critical. Um, one, it, it became the fact that it was the first time in New South Wales curriculum development history um, that um, for schools that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander teachers drafted Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures prior to that in, in mainstream syllabuses. So in the past, prior to that point, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures were largely developed by solely non-Aboriginal um, or non-Indigenous teachers. And, you know, and we have so many wonderful allies, of course, and, uh, and, and that, um, but what we could do by engaging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, teachers in the drafting was that we could very much more quickly access language that was trending in the community. The terms that community knew were, um, were current, were appropriate, um, were um, and in a sense were future proofing. They were going to trend longer, and that meant that that came back. That language came into went into the curriculum, then came back to classroom teachers in the classroom that engaged Aboriginal learners. And so, in some cases, not a, so that was one change. Uh, I think the other significant part of this was that you know um, we, we've ele elevated some of the content into places that are now accessible, including in the HSC in stage six, which has not necessarily been the case before. And that begs the issue of cultural quality assurance of examinations in, HS in the HSC. So um, here I've just given some ideas. So it was 2016, these changes occurred in NESA. And in the next slide, I think what I'll do is just go through very quickly the um, changes that occurred or the, the, the changes we introduced. Firstly, um, we would always have, a, a, NESA would always have an Aboriginal representative on board curriculum committees, which oversaw every syllabus. Now, the changes affected 70 new syllabuses in New South Wales. That's a huge scale, <laughs> I can assure you, for, for some very small units of staff. But because we went through a number of processes, it meant that the final work that was published met expectation. Okay, and it was really favourably received by community, by at the time, you know, various members of the AECG um, when these were first launched or were first published. So uh, the challenge we had, though, was that often, uh, in this case, the AECG was always, um, uh, it, it was just an ongoing um, 
negotiation and partnership was always represented on the B, uh, BCCs, but the traffic was enormous, okay? Large scale curriculum development in one state. And so in the end, the president uh, would identify a nominee or a representative to make it sustainable and to avoid those comments like, oh, but we invited them, but they didn't come, which of course is a very uncritical <laughs> type of statement to make. You know, one would normally think, well, hmm, why didn't the, you know, why did that member not come on this occasion and others? So we solved this by negotiation. Development of guidelines on terminology and nomenclature, right? So that created consistency across, and we use strengths-based language. Uh, part of that was also the induction of curriculum writers uh, by the Aboriginal Curriculum Unit, and, and by that I mean the mainstream uh, non-Indigenous um, curriculum writers, so that we, we started to avoid using almost solely past tense representations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and I, we, we encouraged writers to look at present tense and future tense, and I'll show you some beautiful image, uh, examples in a moment. Um, and as I said, the engagement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander teachers just changed the nature of curriculum writing in this case. Moving along, we had a couple more points. Um, we took the draft content critically, okay? This is critical. Took the draft content out to targeted consultation meetings that were culturally safe spaces for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stakeholders to judge whether we had um, achieve the goals and the expectations of community. And again, this comes back to those research methodologies we, or the methods we talked about. Um, and of course, if we got it wrong, we would be told, you know, <laughs> uh, an auntie will say, no, you need to add this or, or not, well, we're not sure. Is it cultural burn? Is it cultural, is it fire stick farming? And lots of conversation, but then we would follow up by checking on, on websites, you know, where Aboriginal voices being represented on these topics. Um, and then regular presentation by syllabus development managers to the NESA Aboriginal Education Committee. We're very fortunate to have an outstanding former colleague of mine here, Kerry Sheehan is here in the Zoom. And I wanna just take this moment to acknowledge him. Um, Kerry is, was, is the inspector for science uh, syllabuses and uh, wherever you are there, Kerry, um, if it wasn't for you, this would not, this wave of change would not have occurred. So I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Moving along, let's look at some of the content. I think that's the next point. Oh, sorry. This is just a standard text now that didn't exist in mainstream syllabuses before 2017. It, had, it was uh, launched, I suppose, first published in the something like, uh, I think, 19 uh, stage six syllabuses, English, math, science, history around 2017, 18, guiding teachers toward community to check in, to go through that cultural quality assurance process uh, and with some additional help around principles and protocols, which also linked the New South Wales AECG website uh, where you can go to, where they could go to their regions, look at where their local AECG members uh, or committees were. And so that closed the gap. It, it, it was, you know, um, very much cyclic and very much um, uh, supportive of teachers in terms of bringing into um, their classrooms this very new content. And of course, our new vi uh, Vice Chancellor, Mark Scott, um, Vice Chancellor at the University of Sydney, was very much a part of um, training teachers in the Department of Education uh, to be prepared to teach uh, the new content. So let's have a quick look at just some of the examples. As I said, 70 syllabuses uh, have been completely um, re redesigned in this, in this particular area of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures. And I think 40 of those are published. Others are on hold because of the curriculum review that's under, oh, not curriculum review, the, is that right? The uh, curriculum review, sorry, yes. Um, so here we have in Petty Health PE, customer, uh, describe how Aboriginal people stay safe on country. For example, notice it's a dot point. Now, but for those who are not aware of, of politics in curriculum, the dot point means it's likely to be accessible. So that means most children in New South Wales, and some of you have been homeschooling and might know, would, would probably be uh, covering off on this particular topic. Identify customary Aboriginal walking tracks in the local community or region and discuss the health benefits associated with caring for country. You see how strengths-based that is compared to sometimes the content and the way we have been represented in the past as quite deficit or absent. I don't know which is worse, to be honest, both are not uh, optimal. In the New South Wales Arabic K-10 syllabus, now this wasn't, you can see from my earlier tuition, this is not mandatory. 
but it's the first time New South Wales languages syllabuses have incorporated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories. Um, so we have here creating a multimodal documentary in Arabic about Australian tourist attractions, including the significance for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of the sites associated with those tourist attractions, e.g. the Sydney Opera House, on Gadigal country. So I organised for some cultural QA, I rang Gadigal elders to ask would, it, would we have permission for the use of Gadigal country in a government document like that and they were absolutely delighted to know that that was going to occur. The next slide is the last I think and I just want to share with you here in the New South Wales Technology Mandatory 7 to 8 syllabus um, that was published 2017, we have this, I think, rather beautiful point, and, and it is a dot point, which means it's likely to be accessible, uh, and it states, investigate products developed by Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander designers that communicate cultural identity. That represents an incredible shift in the way we have been represented. Um, and here we have uh, in investigating science stage six, assess ways in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples use observation to develop an understanding of country and place, not dissimilar to what Cathy was saying earlier, in order to create innovative ways of managing the natural environment, including but not limited to fire stick farming, knowledge about plants for medicinal purposes. And I have to say that last point appeared in the HSC examination a few years ago to follow. So uh, a huge shout out to Kerry Sheehan, who's in the Zoom right now, for uh, greeting me by saying Aboriginal people, first innovators. Thank you, Kerry. I'll end on that note. Thank you very much. And I know there are some wonderful questions in the chat, which I'm sure we'll get to. Uh, so for Rachel, it would be wonderful if research units comprehended that they need they needed to be funding for Aboriginal people no matter what <laughs> and find sort of creative ways to find banks of Indigenous researchers who could be available to serve to help partner with those Indigenous units and Beatrice I think um, it would be um, it, this work is done by Indigenous people but I think it can be done in a way so that there is a collegial approach to working to together so that Indigenous research methodologies coexist with those use utilising other research methodologies. Sorry to take away time, Cathy, thank you. Thanks um, so much, uh, Chris, for, um, for those experiences and obviously a um, lot to present on, but a lot of work that has really created that change. Um, I just wanted to warn our um, participants that we um, Probably we'll be going over a little piece, but I think this is really important to um, listen from um, Cathy around the community experiences of Indigenous research methodologies. And it's not just based upon them, but they have a, a, a voice and a agency in this work. So over to Cathy. Thanks for Katie and Chris. Um, interesting, Chris, is I, I acknowledge all the work that you've done to make that change within the system and within curriculum for us and it makes our life a little bit easier, but um, our journey as New South Wales ASCG continues because we are now at the coalface of all those new curriculum changes and the ASCG are a part of it and we're embedded in it and we're ensuring that that will continue on. Um, what I'll um, just go on to see myself. How do I get that off? I don't like that. Remove the spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that okay? <laughs> All good, Kathy. All good. <laughs> I don't like to say myself, but anyway, um, I guess from where I'm sitting now, um, and I'm aware of the time, so I could actually talk extensively around this based on our experiences and my experiences in terms of research and the impact of culturally insensitive research has upon us as a people. Um, but I just, I, I'm just gonna take it a different way. And I think that if you pop onto the next slide and I'm conscious of time, it, it's only gonna take me a, a few, few minutes. Um, everything that I've heard today can be summed up in two words, cultural safety. It's ensuring that our stories and our narratives, our knowings, our, our beings, our place 
is captured in a way for us as people to be able to relate to it, to know it, because it is about us. And it's about what happens in that journey of when the data and the information is collected to the end point. And my favourite word out of all words is a word that Chris has used, and it's reciprocity. For whatever we take away, we need to replace and give back. And if the research methodologies that have been used previously aren't given back and the knowledge isn't then passed on to the people who own it, then the inaction of reciprocity has been broken. The New South Wales AECG does have a cultural safety standpoint. And, um, and I guess at this point in time, I have to pay my deepest respects and acknowledge my elders and founding members of the New South Wales ACG. For without them, their fight for justice and basic human rights to an education, I would not be speaking with you here today. Winangai is a word from my language, the Gomoroi language, that has many meanings. It means to know, to think, to remember, to understand and to love. So by using the framework, the, the umbrella, the cocoon, the network of cultural safety, you'll be able to do this together. Your research will be authentic. It will be done in partnership and ownership will belong in the place where it belongs with the knowledge holders. For we will share our stories with you. We will share our histories in the hope that our educators, researchers, institutions, leaders, lawmakers are then held account to what you do with that knowledge. And for what researchers have neglected to reference in the past like those who only hear the words and don't fully listen to understand the true meaning. As a people, the very first people that have been here living in this place since time immemorial, we have been counted, discounted, labelled, relabeled, branded, researched, had data collected on us, analysed, marginalised, and the narrative continues. For example, the world evolves around numbers and data, but data doesn't tell the whole story. You have to have the quality with the quantitative. For when conducting research assessments, monitoring and reporting from our perspective, the New South Wales ACG, we're in the process of developing a cultural framework based on the lived experiences of our community members. And let me qualify that, I'll quantify that, by saying not a framework of cultural competencies. The terminology of cultural competency is a very Western construct and a narrow way of thinking. For to be deemed competent, you have gained all the knowledges required and there is no limit and, that, and it's limited for growth, sorry. However, for us as Aboriginal people, this is a lifelong journey. For us as individuals, we aren't armed with all the knowledge or all the knowledges. For knowledge is just knowledge if it isn't shared. It's reciprocal and it's enacted through the process of reciprocity. Aboriginal community members, experiences of Indigenous research methodologies and Aboriginal community controlled led research hasn't always been told through our experiences and our narratives. It's been told through history and through his story. 
the New South Wales ACG say to you that it is now our time to determine the hows, the whys, the what ifs, so that we remain sovereign of story and sovereign of data. And this will allow us to share the significance of country, place, time, connections, and relationships. The importance of today is that you are here with us in this time to share this space. And once again, I will and we will take away new knowledges and new learnings with you. For we are all in a different place of our lives to make learning. And as president of the New South Wales ACG, I thank you for the work and support you with your endeavors. Finally, I'll leave with you these words to sum up my presentation. And it's how we say what cultural safety is to us as an organization. So cultural safety is something that cannot be categorized, placed into a box or ticked off as being a tune. For some Aboriginal and First Nations peoples, this is a lifelong twist. The New South Wales Aboriginal Education Consultative Group's position is very clear and concise with our meaning or our standing. Cultural safety in Australia is a process to better enable First Nations participation. That was by Phillips in 2015. It requires the accumulation and application of First Nations knowledges of ways of knowing and being to be embedded in structural and systematic reforms. Mason, 2013. All Aboriginal First Nations students, parents, caregivers, community members, and employees have the basic human right to feel culturally safe across all living and non-living entities. Workplaces, educational centres, and within the wider community in which we live. Cultural safety instructs and requires that equality is upheld and that diverse needs are respected and responded to through policy and practice. It is the inherent right that Aboriginal First Nations people are informed and involved in research, in promoting cultural safety and well-being to enable participation without threats to their, our unique way of life and cultural background. Aboriginal First Nations peoples are generally more astutely aware of how one's own cultural values, knowledges, skills and attitudes are formed, affect and may impact upon others. Therefore, it is imperative that all people must ethically uphold a responsibility to address their own unconscious cultural biases, racism and discriminations. The New South Wales ACG acknowledges and respects the diversity of cultures, languages, ways of beings and laws, L-O-R-E-S, that the state of New South Wales traverses those that are older than time itself. We reverently respect the right of all New South Wales Aboriginal and First Nations people to be offered and afforded the respect to define and locally self-determine our own cultural safety and knowledges that are free from prejudices, judgments and inequalities. And I'll say to you, Yalu Yanea Gavaminda, Malia, um, thanks for listening. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's my thanks. summation. Thanks so much, Kathy. That was, you know, it was brilliant. It was so powerful. I do have a question that has come from the group that I thought I might, especially what you've just presented there on cultural safety. Um, around that space of how do we privilege Indigenous voices in spaces that aren't culturally safe? Um, and the term here was anti-Indigenous. So you know, obviously a lot of you're working in a lot of political spaces and how do you manage that tension or navigate people who really don't want to see um, Indigenous people in those spaces? So just to, however you want to answer that question. Great question. And those that know me know that um, I'm not here to make people comfortable. I'm here to tell the truth and by sharing the truth, and sharing my story and those of community, people can no longer say that they um, didn't know or they're, they're, they're ignorant or they're, they're, they don't have the knowledge of the understanding. 
it's what you do with the knowledge, like anything, that leaves the impact. You can ignore it, you can take it away. But for me, I'm 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 not here to uh, and my presence sometimes apparently makes people <laughs> um, uncomfortable because I'm very much to the point, but I do it hopefully respectfully, and I hope it in a way that I'm able to get my point across without any animosity. And I think there are spaces that I've walked into and my Terminator radar has said, yep, this isn't a really good space to be. Stand your ground, think of your ancestors and just say it like it is. And as the New South Wales president of the ACG, it's about us empowering our local community members to work within the confines, but it's also ensuring that we encourage each and every person who is out there who feels uncomfortable with our presence, presence to ensure that they start to walk the journey with us and we will work with them to be able to ensure that we come to a, a, you know, a good ending. It's, 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 we cannot no longer work in silence and, so, and be silent and we can no longer work in isolation. We need to do it together for our stories to remain where they are and belong. <laughs> Brilliant. And, you know, um, yeah, some of these pathways are hard work, um, but, you know, like it was shown today that the, the change that is possible is phenomenal um, opportunities for us as well. And I know you shared a bit of Gomeroy language around, you know, that philosophy for you and for me. And I know Chris shared this earlier with um, some of the works she was mentioning, uh, Jonathan jo Jones's PhD yes. work. But one of our words in Wiradjuri is Yinjamara, um, to respect, to go slowly. And I think there's so much of the work that we step out as we, you know, work with people who want to work with us. And I think um, those Indigenous and non-Indigenous spaces and, you know, bringing allies along on the journey is such a big piece of the puzzle. Um, and we can't do it. Like our... You know, community controlled organisations are awesome, like uh, New South Wales AECG. But um, there's a lot, there's a lot of change as well, and we need everyone to come on the journey. And so I think that's really um, a powerful. Um, I know I've been privileged to listen to you, Kathy. It's great to meet you, and um, uh, Chris, um, great to work with you and um, and the work that we're doing in this space. So I want to thank everyone for staying with us, and we will be sending out the slides, the information, and uh, the, the video recordings. So I think it's just the, it's so powerful, the knowledge that's been shared today, and I think that should go far and wide. And we thank Kathy and Chris for their considerable time um, contributing to this space for us. Thanks so much. Bye for now.